Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Malin Olson. I'm a member of the Redis Open Source Project. Um, and I'm also an engineer at AWS. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to use Redis uh, in cloud native architectures to build an asynchronous messaging system. Um, and before I talk too much about the agenda, I like the motivation for this talk is I know a lot of people use Redis. Just kind of like quick show of hands, who here is aware of what Redis is? It's like everyone. Who here thinks Redis is just a cache? So those, like, it's, it's really tailored for you guys, um, which is that a lot of people know, just like they don't know what else Redis can do. And they often think about it, it's just like an ephemeral data store. You throw data in it and it can go away. So um, I, the specific use case I'm gonna dive deep into today um, is the event broker kind of design pattern. So I'll start kind of introducing that, explain how it works in traditional service-oriented architectures. Then I'll kind of give a pseudo introduction to Redis. It seems like most people know, so I won't go too deep, but kind of talk a little bit about why it's good at what it does, um, not talk too much about what it is, and then kind of put Redis in to this uh, architecture we're talking about and see how it actually kind of fits the, that role. And then I'll uh, show kind of a simple toy application, kind of putting everything together. Um, and I'll close off with some best practices and then we'll hopefully have some time for some Q&A if people have questions. Great. So, um, why, like, what, what, why do people need message brokers? So in traditional service-oriented architectures, um, you basically have a lot of different services and they're all talking to each other with tightly coupled APIs. Um, this works pretty well. Um, some people might know Amazon is well known for having this very complex service-oriented architecture because they used to have this big monolith, had lots of problems, so they broke everything up. So service-oriented or architecture is great. The problem starts to stem when that starts to get very complex, right? When you have one service calling lots of other services, you end up with, you know, dependency hell and a very high latency as all of these services start chaining together. Um, you also start seeing issues with being able to maintain SLAs as when one of these microservices fail, the whole architecture might stop working. So the idea behind that um, to solve this is like uh, either a message brokering architecture. So the idea behind here is you do all your synchronous work and then you just record an event that all the other services eventually read and then they you know, take their actions based on that. So this breaks the tight coupling. You still have some coupling since these uh, messages need to be still well formed so all of the uh, downstream consumer services know what's going on. Um, but it solves kind of those two major problems we had before. So the first is now we get back to having super low latency since all we have to do is do our synchronous work and then record the event into the event, uh, the message broker. And then we also have much better uh, API uh, SLAs since um, we're just now dependent on the synchronous work and all of the asynchronous work kind of can just happen in the background. If a service dies, it doesn't affect the main APIs. So if you were to have you know, an e-commerce website, you wanna make sure those orders are going through. And if you're doing some of the non-essential work, that can always happen later. So when you have a message uh, broker architecture, it becomes very easy to scale and add more services in since you just need to define how these services consume sort of from this main message bus. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna just talk about these message bus in two different forms. The first is what I'm gonna call an authoritative log. So an authoritative log, you basically have a single stream of every single message that ever was produced as part of this um, message bus. And so if you're just wanting to spin up a new service, let's say we have some new business intelligence that needs to know like what's going on, it's able to basically go back in time, start from the beginning of the log, consume everything to the head of the log, and basically bootstrap as a new service. So this is one type of good use case. Um, the other really common use case I've seen, and it's pretty common with Redis and with a lot of our customers, is what I call like ephemeral logs. So the best frame for this is that you could lose a message. And so that's, a lot of people get kind of scared of that. They're like, why would I wanna lose a message from a log? And the best place to think about this is if late events are the same as the message not showing up at all. Um, if you have some type of, you know, maybe you're delivering um, some type of package and that you're trying to give like real time updates to the end user, you wanna give a real time update of where that package is. If you're gonna deliver two days late, they don't care anymore. You can just have basically the same as dropped it. Um, there's some other interesting use cases, like maybe you're okay with inconsistencies between your services because you have some background reconciliation. 
Storing data durably is relatively expensive, comparing to storing stuff sort of as a best effort. So if you're okay with periodic drift and you have some mechanism to reconcile it, then that's a good maybe use case for having something more ephemeral. Okay, so those are sort of like the main basics of how you have a message broker. So what type of data store do we want to use for this? Um, ideally, we want to so support those two different types of cases, the authoritative log case and the ephemeral case. We want it to be highly performant and scalable. Um, those are, you know, it's cloud native. We want everything to be performant and scalable. Um, and we want to be able to support different types of events, um, so not something that's too specific to one individual use case, and can shard to different individual um, types of logs. You don't want to be, if you have one specific log that holds all your data, it will eventually become the bottleneck for your service. And of course, we're at Kubernetes conference. We want it to be industry standard and we would love open APIs. So with that, I'm going to suggest Redis as a good way um, to solve that problem. Uh, I know a couple of people said they didn't know what Redis is, but Redis is a fast and simple in-memory first data store. Uh, it's completely open source. As I mentioned, I'm one of the maintainers. We love active, we have a very active community. Um, we're still building a lot uh, with inside the, uh, and we're still releasing new versions. So the main trade-off the Redis kind of thinks about is that it stores everything in memory first, and then optionally will persist stuff to disk. So it doesn't try to uh, expose many trade-offs for end users, right? So it's not one of those applications that will try to make it as easy for the uh, consumer to the client to use, um, but it wants to make it like predictably high performance. Um, REST is also well known to be very flexible, has lots of data structures, and we'll be talking about one of those specifically today, and that it also has high availability and various forms of durability. So um, the main framing I want us to use for REST today is that it's that um, it's that basically a, it's an API for shared data, um, and you can build applications on top of it, right? So if you have one client who writes data, everyone else can read from it. So if that's the one frame you take away, like that's what I kind of want for the rest of the talk. Um, I know most people, you know, raise their hands when I mentioned Redis as a cache. This is what, by and large, everyone uses Redis for. Um, the idea being that since Redis is in memory first and not necessarily durable, you're able to do expensive operations, take the result of it, and then stick it in Redis. And then when your application goes and tries to do that same operation again, it's able to first check for Redis. So this is by far the traditional use case for Redis. Um, and this works great without durability, without replication, um, and fits into a lot of uh, uh, service-oriented architectures. Um, the use case I'm trying to push more for Redis generally is this idea of um, beyond caching, which incorporates a bunch of different aspects, but one specific one I want to talk about is data projection. So this sort of fits into this message broker we talked about earlier, where you have a primary database, and then it emits a series of logs based for the updates from that um, that like for mutations, and then Redis is able to consume those updates and then project the, some form of the data into Redis. So the, the authoritative data still comes from Redis, uh, sorry, still comes from the backend database. In this case, I'm using Postgres everywhere. Um, and if Redis were to die, you'd basically be able to go back to the Postgres database, reproject all the data. Um, and eventing works really great in this case, right? So one of the things that's nice about Redis is it has periodic backups. So you can basically take an entire snapshot of the data set, save it to disk, and then restore that snapshot. So if you keep track of where you are in the updates from the message uh, bus, you're able to like restart from that point in time. So Redis is, a great, uh, is already great in message bus systems. Um, and I'd like to argue that it can also be great for actual the message bus itself. So um, what types of functionality does Redis have to build uh, messaging? So there are two, there could theoretically be a third, but there's usually two main um, use cases that Redis has that people use. The first is what's called PubSub. So publish and subscribe. Clients are able to subscribe to channels inside Redis. And when messages get published to those channels, Redis then broadcasts the messages to all the various consumers of that channel. So you might see here, this doesn't work at all for authoritative logs. It's really just targeting that sort of ephemeral workload. And it's really targeting just making it as simple as possible because there's no data being stored within Redis. It's just immediately broadcasting it out. So it's really good for 
um, the normal thinking about Redis where you don't really have any type of schema. You just push data in, broadcast the data out, and then you kind of forget about it. Uh, fire and forget is often used to describe PubSub. Um, the second um, data structure, which was released in Redis 5, which is like four years old now, uh, is what's called Redis Streams. So Redis Streams took a lot of inf uh, inspiration from Kafka and is basically a uh, append-only log of data. So that's, this sort of fits more into our, our paradigm we just had of, of an authoritative log. So you put a bunch of events in Redis, and then um, you're able to cooperatively consume them through what's called consumer groups, or an individual client can basically keep track of where they are um, and then keep reading from that point in time. This data will need to eventually be trimmed out of Redis. Cool. So, um, so how do these two actually look? Um, most everything in Redis uses commands. It doesn't have any query language, like something like SQL. So in this case, we have a command called xAd, which is responsible for adding data into streams. Um, so you have a stream name, and it has a corresponding unique ID that's generated. Uh, you can also ask Redis to generate a stream, automatic, uh, sorry, stream ID automatically for you when you push the message. So in this case, we're pushing a message um, that says message hello into a stream called my stream, and it produces a unique identifier when you push it into Redis. And then uh, the consumers are able to pull this data out. Uh, and then also, as I said earlier, there's, um, so there's X-Read if you're just consuming it yourself, or you can cooperatively consume stuff. Um, the demo I'll show in a second is going to show this cooperative consumption of data. Um, and then similarly, we have the pub subsystem, which does something uh, very similar, but in a sense kind of in the reverse. So consumers are the ones that start the transaction. They say, hey, I would like to subscribe to this channel. And then when messages are published into the channel, uh, everyone's able to get basically how many messages were broadcast and everyone that got the consumers. So with these two data structures, we're able to basically kind of stick Redis where it was before, right? Where the message broker was way back when the early part of the stock. So streams provide the good authoritative log as well as can be used for the ephemeral uh, logs that we talked about. And PubSub can also then be used as part of the ephemeral use case as well. So we mentioned before that we also needed um, some type of partitioning of streams. So Redis has a deployment called Redis Cluster Mode, which is a natively sharded deployment. And it then partitions the data by the CRC16 of either the name, which can either be the channel name or the uh, name of the stream. So that's all well and good. Um, but there is still an elephant in the room that I haven't really talked too much, too much about. Um, it's not Postgres. I do like Postgres. Postgres was known to be the most loved database, which stole away Redis's title. Uh, but it's actually durability of data. So most people think Redis is not durable. And for the vast majority of people that actually use Redis, it's not, it's not right? People deploy it without um, any mechanism of strong durability. So the default configuration of Redis is that, even if you had Redis uh, replicas, um, even if you had the built-in mechanism called AOF, um, which is the append-only log, most people use AOF without a very specific flag, which is uh, f-sync every write, which means that before we acknowledge any write to a client, we will actually make sure it's persisted to disk. And even in that case, if it's only persisted to one disk, it's not super durable. So even though most people don't use Res durably, it does have ways to be used durably. Um, you, can do, you can set it up in such a way so you're actually f-syncing to multiple different disks. And then you have to build some type of mechanism to restore that um, after node failure. So Redis is not particularly great at being durable, but it can be. So um, it can be used as its authoritative log because it's still good at that high throughput, high efficiency type workloads. Um, so I will argue that it can be used for that. And in many cases, using a durable store for an event bus is better than using an ephemeral store because it makes it simple. You don't have to worry too much about messages not getting delivered. But a lot of event bridges inherently assume like some type of item potency, or having to think through you know, how to handle at least once or at most once type of messages. So the ephemeral workload, still, you still have to solve a lot of the same problems. So even though if you're not using durable, Redis can still work pretty well um, as an event bus in either mode. Um, and there is also multiple managed providers that provide Redis-like APIs that do provide durability. 
So if you don't want to self-manage durability, there are, there are still options, and you're still able to you know, do all the local testing because you have the open source project to test against. Cool. So best practices for Redis at scale. Um, as I mentioned briefly, Redis has a shared nothing uh, partitioning scheme when you use it in its clustered con uh, configuration. Um, you can typically get between 100,000 and 150,000 operations per like, process per core. Um, in typical non-durable configurations, it falls to between like 60 to 100,000 operations per second in more durable configurations. Uh, but you can scale out to about 1,000 different shards, um, which gives somewhere around um, like 50 to 150 million operations per second, um, which is pretty much higher than anyone I've ever seen practically use. We have a couple of customers at AWS who get, kind of get close to those numbers. Um, but practically, it, it, there's plenty of scaling room as long as you have a good way to shard the data. Um, starting with Redis 7, we actually introduced um, what's called sharded PubSub. In the olden days before Redis 7, there was no good sharding for PubSub messages. So in Redis 7, it's not... That's more or less been fixed. That was contributed by AWS. Um, and then also, if you want high availability for your data, a high availability is not as important for event buses because if you kind of take an outage for a while and bring up a new node, um, it will still like you, that you have that built in uh, slack because you don't need the synchronous operation. So it's not as important, um, but you should understand like when you actually do need it. Um, and if you think about it, if you're adding replicas, you're really optimizing for that case when failures do happen, and 99% of the time they aren't happening, so you're paying that cost. So just be very deliberate about choosing to run with replication. And then the important thing about Redis is it does not try to solve hot, hot keys or hot channels for you. Um, so if you do end up funneling too much data into one shard, um, that shard will get overwhelmed and you'll have problems. So, and Redis, as I said before, just doesn't try to solve those problems for you. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned before, um, the, when you're using an authoritative log, eventually you'll need to trim data. Um, so in that case, you'll typically take the hot data and keep it in Redis. Um, Redis is, as I said, memory in memory first. All the data is stored in memory. Uh, so you don't actually want that because that's expensive. So you eventually want to tear it to disk. So most people running with this will want to have some type of system to take the data from Redis in memory, and then spill it to disk. Ideally, magnetic drives. SSDs can work, um, but it's usually not as needed. Um, and then time-based events for ephemeral logs can usually just be trimmed based on capacity or time, uh, kind of based on what you want. Um, the Redis snapshotting mechanism I talked about a little bit earlier can also work kind of well here. If your data is set up in such a way that the events all sort of can get compacted together and put into the end, at like an end state, um, like if you have multiple different values and you're like continuing updating it, Redis snapshots probably a good way to just sort of compact all the logs events together so you can kind of stick it on disk and then restore that. Um, that's a little bit more specific. Um, it depends a little bit on your use case. So I've been talking a lot about just about Redis. Um, but since Redis is an open source project um, and is one of the most downloaded Redis, uh, sorry, Docker containers, it has a lot of support uh, for all the CNCF projects. Uh, I'll specifically be talking a bunch about how it integrates with Prometheus, what type of metrics to look at to make sure it doesn't kind of explode. Because um, Redis, as I said, it's like it's, a lot of people think of it's kind of like a race car. It like, can go really fast, but if you kind of drift a little too much, it just spirals out and explodes. So it's very important to make sure you kind of understand those failure modes. Cool. So with that, I'm going to walk through a short little demo and kind of walk through how you can actually use Redis in this configuration. If it works. There we go. Cool. All right. And I have internet, so this is all working. <gasps> cool. Everything's connected. Um, so in this example, there'll be three main components we'll be talking about. There's going to be a web app, a queue that's consuming data, and a generator of data that we'll throw load in a second. I actually don't want this thing generating, uh, consuming any load for the hot second, so we'll turn that off. Um, some people might ask, one of my favorite things is just that, like, I love Kubernetes. It's so nice to use. I've been so long as a database engineer that I forgot that some things can actually be nice. Writing in C all the time, I'm used to things being painful. Um, <laughs> cool. So, um, 
So the main part of this is we have a very simple web application. Um, it's built in Flask. And so you know, we have some configuration, set up the REST connection, yada, yada, yada. Um, if people want, I could, I can, I was planning on posting this at some point in the future, um, just to sort of em uh, emphasize this. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of concepts up here that are good to know about. Um, all of our events are going to have a very specific schema. You should probably use something more like protobuf or something, but I wanted this because it's a little bit more readable to at least follow. Um, and once you use protobuf, everything kind of gets lost. So this is a very simple web API that basically implements an order functionality. Um, so we do some, you know, unmarshalling of the data, get the arguments out, uh, create an object on top of it, and then all, like, this is the main operation we do. We just do an XAD. Um, you'll see I do in a batch. Um, Redis is a little bit more performant when you send a bunch of argument commands together. Um, I do this just to, for some monitoring aspects later. In a newer version of Redis, it'll be much easier to see the size of streams, but right now there isn't, so I have to keep track of that all manually. So not super important, but uh, as you can see here, the only thing we're doing in this order operation is just putting an item in the stream. In the real world, we probably want to be doing other synchronous work, making sure we have capacity, making sure the user is authenticated, but that's all, you know, business logic. We'll figure that out kind of in a second. Um, and what are we doing this, um, with this? We're putting it in a stream, and then we'll have two consumers for this. The first consumer will be showing the last item this user has purchased, and the second is we will be showing the overall top sellers um, for this given operation. Okay, so let's quickly make sure this is all working. Not that one, this one. So let's buy an item, make sure this is all working. Okay, and so we got the basically the stream ID that was generated as well as the size of the uh, queues that were generated. So I mentioned before all this data is being ingested into Prometheus. I can prove that it's you know, actually through Prometheus, it's over here. Everything's up. Um, we have a Redis exporter, which is generating met metrics from Redis, and then we have a custom exporter in that web app that's basically showing latency. Um, so we have one item in the queue. It's not being processed. It's been unconsumed. Um, we have a log size. I was putting some data in here earlier, so it's non-zero, but it's there. And we're seeing latency about four to five milliseconds. Um, a lot of people are used to Redis being sub-milliseconds, but I'm using Redis in a more durably stored configuration. So we're actually running to three separate AZs inside AWS, which takes a little bit more time. So that all looks great. Uh, oops, not there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm also going to start putting some load on here. Let's add some load. Um, the thing I want to show is I want to show that uh, this kind of, the queues kind of keep growing, and then once everything is all scaled up, We'll add some consumers of the data. I'll have this refresh a little bit more regularly. Oh, uh, yeah, one other thing I wanted to show you was that uh, I can prove that this actually hasn't been consuming yet because um, this history is still empty because we, the consumer of the data, has not consumed the data. So while everything is starting to start up, I'll quickly show what the consumers look like. Consumer. So the consumers are really simple. Um, so we have, uh, down here, we have a function that we're calling basically when an item actually gets processed. So we're using, we're still using Redis for everything, because why not? Um, we're using a sorted set to keep track of the top selling items. And then we're just storing the last purchased item in a hash value. So going back and talking a little bit what we said before, we're gonna use the X group uh, commands. Um, which are the cooperative consumers, so we can have multiple different nodes consuming multiple different nodes consuming data. Um, so, being very unredis-like, you actually have to call an explicit function to do X group creates, and have to like catch exceptions if you do it multiple times. Um, typically, Redis is very schemaless, but not in this case. Um, we're still trying to work on a better way to do that, but we'll figure it out eventually. So, how do we actually consume the data? We have the X group read command. So we have uh, every um, stream. So we have the stream name here, and then we have the worker name, which is the, oops. So the, the group is created on a stream, and then you read from a group. And so that makes sure that uh, every message within the stream is only delivered once. So 
uh, lots of fun stuff here. There's some just plumbing to basically bootstrap a node if it hasn't consumed anything. This just means start consuming from the beginning. Um, and then we're consuming up to 500 elements and we're waiting one second in case there is no items currently in the stream. Um, the other interesting case we have to cover is when an item gets, um, every item that's read from a group has to be acknowledged. And if an item is dropped, we need someone to go and claim it. So we have a separate command called xAutoClaim, which will allow you to actually claim commands which aren't owned if they're idle for at least one, uh, one second. And this does mean in this configuration, we're doing it most once. Um, since a node could have read an item, gone off, you know, done whatever, been disconnected for more than a second, um, Kubernetes might have not killed it, let it keep running, and then it will come back and acknowledge that it's done the work. So in this case, everything should more or less be item potent. Um, so let's see, did this thing run? Okay, so at least we know everything's now running. Um, so let's go back, look at here. So we have, um, we can see that the number of elements is steadily growing with the log size, keeps growing up and up and up. We've added, we've been continually adding items to the log. And the unconsumed message uh, kind of ticked up for a second, and that's because we started the producers faster than the consumers. Uh, and then it kind of came back down. It's been hovering around zero, not quite zero. I will say also, this metric is not quite accurate, but I was too afraid to fix it right before the demo, so it's, it drifts a little bit. Um, and then this pending queue size shows the number of outstanding messages. So uh, the one last thing I kind of want to show is if we go and then kill the... Uh, let's increase the number of load generators because we want to show that, um, you know, if a queue starts growing over time, you kind of want to start setting um, alarms on that. Do, 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 do. Not that. Uh, this one. Um, I talked a bit about, you know, how to make sure you're alarming. Um, you definitely want to make sure you have, if you're not consuming messages, you need some type of alarm on that. So it depends on, you know, you should figure out your application to figure out how fast you can consume messages and figure out how long you're willing to tolerate messages not being consumed. Because um, once the queue star gets too long, it will take a long time for it to actually drain back out. And you can have other problems as well that aren't immediately obvious in your system. Um, there's actually been a lot of very notable AWS events, AWS outages that are kind of basically this problem. Um, where you have a huge backlog of items and you're not able to effectively process them. Um, there's one interesting paradigm inside AWS where if you're falling too far behind, what you should start doing is instead of process, processing first in, first out, you should do the opposite. Start processing last in, first out. So you're actually doing some successful requests um, and actually kind of getting latency down. Um, otherwise, you might just kind of keep getting further and further behind. How's this going? It's all starting. Should have probably figured out a better series to actually do this. Yeah, these are all still creating. And eh, maybe we'll come back to this in a second. Um, and I can quickly go and catch the last of the best practices. Best practices. Um, so yeah, this is the last thing I want to talk about. Um, when building message brokering systems, the most important thing is you really need to understand what's, what needs to be done synchronously. Um, in this, you know, web app example we were talking about, like, no user likes to get a successfully purchased and then found out, oh, no, async had failed because we didn't actually have capacity. So make sure you know what needs to be done synchronously, what needs to be communicated to users. Um, since if something is failing asynchronously, you kind of need to, like, you need to know how to resolve that because um, you didn't give a synchronous error to users. Um, and make sure you test failure modes. As I said, this is a pattern which is really helps, but it also can be a huge thorn in the side. Reminds me a lot of caching in that case. A lot of people have failures because their cache falls over and then they storm their backend database and sad things happen. So just like, I feel like in a lot of places with Redis, just making sure you understand your failure modes and you test them regularly. Um, in the example we were just kind of talking about, to try making sure, like just turn off all your consumers, see what, see what happens when you restart them. Cold starts are, nice and easy to do in Kubernetes for the most part. Um, another important thing is to like really make sure you're avoiding poison pills. Make sure you have like schemas for events and that everyone is like adhering to them. Uh, your messaging system should validate that schema and not accept messages that don't conform to it. Um, once you have like a poison pill in your system, it can like kind of bring everything down. I had a bug earlier when I was building this demo where I actually put a, 
a character, like a S inside the user ID, when it was expect everything else was expecting it to be purely ints. Um, and then nothing was accepting it, and it was took a long time to debug. And that would have helped if I actually had been properly validating stuff instead of just shoving it in Redis. Um, monitoring, uh, we already talked about this a little bit. Make sure you have enough burst capacity to handle whatever type of load you want to do. Um, especially in the Redis case, when Redis can actually burst into memory, make sure you have enough like spare memory capacity. Uh, queues are typically a good use case for Redis because um, you usually don't consume all that much memory. You kind of like you add items or remove items, so memory stays pretty constant. Um, but make sure you have enough to actually burst into. Uh, and the last thing is uh, message partitioning. We talked a little bit about how to name uh, stuff in Redis using like CRC 16. Uh, it's still important to understand like how you like what's the right dimension to partition your messages on. Um, most people do it by something like a user ID or a customer ID. Um, but there's other ways as well, like um, like you know based like just logically grouping stuff instead of doing something like a hash on top of a customer ID. Um, so. That's all I have for you at the moment. I believe I'm supposed to show you a QR code and give you something. So I'll just briefly say, like, thank you, Madeline Olson. You can follow me on Twitter. Here's the QR code if you need it. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have. Does anyone know how to, like, question? Do people come and ask questions? Is that a thing? Sure. What's up? I have no idea. How is that, is, does anyone else have examples, or do people just go and mingle? Oh, we have microphones. Nice. I, it's not on. Or, uh, to go to Reddit? OK, I'll, I repeat. If we're already using uh, Kafka as a message broker for the same uh, purpose, is there a reason to, up, to, to change to Redis, or is it just a matter of preferences? For the most part, I've seen like Redis. So Kafka really only sports the the logs more of, and it stores everything durably. If you don't need that durably, that's the biggest reason I've seen people move away from Kafka, because uh, Redis tends to be more efficient and has lower cost to operate. But I would say it's a lot about preference. Um, a lot of people already have Redis in their deployments already, and people understand it. Um, it's kind of nice to use one system for multiple things as opposed to kind of purpose-built things everywhere. So. I, but yeah, it is ultimately more or less a preference thing. Yeah. Uh, so um, thanks for the presentation. So uh, when the pub sub uh, messages are being stored, it's, I'm assuming it's also stored in the Redis. Um, so what happens if I have a burst and I have this loss of messages that are being pub, uh, generated and that's causing a um, huge memory usage? So what would be your recommendation around uh, um, you know um, burst capacity? Uh, planning and what are the uh, things that we should plan, uh, memory, disk, um, and, and things like that. Thanks. Yeah, especially for memory, um, as I said, it kind of really comes down to your capacity planning. At some point, you should stop accepting messages if you're running, if you have no memory, like spare memory to actually like put them. Um, so typically, you want to start like, you want to reject them and have the back pressure push it back to the front end so it, like things stop adding more data in. So you'll want to, for capacity planning, that's, I mean, so it's very, you know, system dependent. At AWS, we usually do like, you know, 10x kind of what we expect to be the worst case to make sure we have capacity for that. Um, in this case, it's much easier to super over provision. This is, um, it's almost uh, message queues are almost always CPU and throughput bound, not memory bound, unless you're like really far and falling far behind. Um, so try to figure out like how, like how much time are you willing to keep accepting writes before you kind of have a hard outage is another thing we you do at AWS. Um, like for we have like uh, um, when we do like authentication, we have like six hours. So we usually say you need at least six hours of reasonable extra capacity before you should start rejecting uh, requests. Um, but obviously that becomes very different if you're actually very constrained on memory or disk. Um, then you might need to keep less surplus. Um, for disk, yeah, you have the same problem if you're using with AOF. Um, you should figure out how much you're willing to spill um, before you start actually rejecting the front-end apps. Because most of the time, message brokers are used to keep availability up and have low latency. Does that help? Yeah. We'll try to get you a microphone. Unless you want to yell and I can repeat it. <laughs> 
That's fair. It works. Um, what recommendations do you have to ensure durability for streams in the event of node failures? Can you say that one more time? Yes. Uh, what recommendations do you have if you want to have durable streams that tolerate node failures? So for example, like if your cloud provider or if you want to upgrade nodes and that requires node restarts, um, and if you want to maintain a given stream, like have it still remain available, mm -hmm. Um, what recommendations do you have for that? Uh, yeah, so typically you'll not just want to do a node restart on a node that doesn't have any backup of the data that will lose the data. Um, I think AOF is usually the best thing for that because you can take a synchronous flush basically of the data and restart with it. Um, some of the managed providers like do that all for you. So I mean, yeah, basically just don't restart the node. Um, have some backup of the data. I think we're out of time, so. Thank, all, thank you all for coming. If you have more questions, I'll hang out and thanks a lot.